Hi, I'm Pastor Brian Schwertley of Reformation Fellowship Reformed Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And welcome to Reformation Forum, the program relating the unchanging truth of Scripture to current issues. And tonight we have a real exciting program for you. We're going to look at cults and the occult, two very fascinating subjects. And uh, these are important topics in our day when people are uh, thinking of uh, UFOs and the tales of comets and uh, committing mass suicide. And there are all sorts of bizarre, dangerous cults out there. And if you have children and... Uh, you just need to watch this program and really absorb this information. You know, recently we had the largest mass suicide in United States history. Uh, what was it, 29? 39. 39 people. Um, and uh, w this was the Heaven's Gate cult. And his blind allegiance to an authority figure, uh, I mean, blind allegiance in, is common in cults to some authority figure. These guys would do anything that their leader said. Uh, why is this? Well, Brian, uh, before I, I answer that question, I, I just wanted to note that uh, World Magazine, the Christian news magazine, which is an excellent magazine, by the way, it uh, had a very clever title, and it called it Hell at Heaven's Gate. And I thought that was very, very apt and uh, very perceptive. But anyway, why is it that the cults seem to have uh, blind allegiance to uh, a, a, an authority figure? Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that a lot of it has to do with the charisma of the leader, uh, uh, someone who has personal charisma that is uh, just a naturally a natural born leader and people just naturally f follow him. But you know, the Bible warns against this and it does it in a number of ways. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 13, it says, obey them that have the rule over you. It's speaking about in the sphere of the church. In religion, obey them that have the rule over you. It's never obey him that has the rule over you. The Bible never requires blind allegiance to a single human leader. The only one to whom we owe ultimate allegiance is the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is the king and head of the church. We owe no uh, blind allegiance to any human leader, whether it would be a pope or whether it would be a, a uh, very uh, personable, charismatic kind of uh, pastor uh, lording it over the local church. As a matter of fact, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, and I've referred to this before, this is such a wonderful, liberating, precious truth that I cannot help but uh, refer to it again. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, the apostle Peter, who uh, many religious leaders take to be the first pope and uh, uh, one to whom people in the first century owed blind allegiance, although there's no teaching to that effect in the Bible, he said, uh, I exhort the elders, who am also an elder, just an elder. See his humility. He's humble as he comes through here. And he says, feed the flock of God, which is under you, taking the oversight thereof. And then he says, neither being lords, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Some of the modern translations would put it something like this, uh, not lording it over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. That is the model of a godly biblical leader. If any religious leader, any religious leader, any religious leader requires blind allegiance to himself as a condition for membership in his organization, don't walk, run the other way, get away. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has set up a plurality of leaders in his church uh, called the eldership, and we are to obey them that have the rule over us, never him. And uh, this uh, a recent example, this tragic uh, thing that took place out in California at the Heaven's Gate cult, uh, the mass suicide, 39 people uh, dying supposedly peacefully, uh, and yet uh, hell at Heaven's Gate as they all committed suicide and broke the, uh, the, the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill, which also prohibits us from killing our own life, taking our own life as well as the life of others. Uh, these individuals were following a, an authoritarian figure, and they followed him right to uh, Hell's Gate and not Heaven's Gate. Well, Brian, uh, we are talking about cults and the occult tonight, and a lot of people are linking UFOs with the occult. As a matter of fact, the Heaven's Gate cult was supposedly going out to meet some spaceship after the Hale-Bopp 
comment. But anyway, does the Bible say anything about UFOs? And uh, what are some theories that Christian writers hold concerning UFOs? <clears throat> well, uh, some have tried to say, I, I don't know if you remember back in the 70s, there was a book by, I believe his name was Eric von Donegan, uh, something about uh, Battle of the Gods or something, I forget what it was called, but he basically was saying that uh, the Bible teaches that there were UFOs and aliens who came to Earth and all these ancient cultures. And uh, his book has basically been disproved as a fraud, but uh, the Bible does not speak about UFOs. Uh, the strange chariot in the sky that you read about in Ezekiel, sometimes people try to say that is a UFO. Uh, it's obviously not a UFO. It's a, an apocalyptic, apocalyptic imagery used by the prophet, and it's not a UFO. The Bible does not speak about UFOs. Now, I've read many books, secular and by Christians, uh, about UFOs and strange phenomena. And there are basically four ideas about UFOs that are out there. Uh, let's just talk about them briefly. One, uh, many believe that UFOs don't exist at all, that there are many strange electrical things that happen and weather patterns and various things. And they basically try to explain UFOs away through natural phenomena. Uh, for example, uh, near fault lines, there it has been observed bizarre electrical phenomena like balls in the sky and things like that. So that is one theory. Another theory is that these are actual beings from another planet in spacecrafts. So that's one theory. And then another theory is that these are beings that have always lived on Earth. They're from a lost civilization and they're hiding somewhere inside of the Earth. That's another theory. And then there's another theory. The fourth theory is that UFOs are demonic manifestations. Now, why would uh, Christian writers say that, that they think they're demonic manifestations? Well, let's just examine this briefly. First of all, if you look at the sightings all over the Earth, the beings that are supposedly seen uh, look very similar. And if you, uh, there are a number of people that have supposedly been taken up in the spacecraft and have communicated with these beings. And these beings all have a very similar message, a very uh, satanic, New Age kind of philosophy. And, uh, and for that reason, some Christian authors have stated that they believe that these are demonic manifestations that are uh, specifically done to delude mankind, to, to uh, trick mankind. And uh, whatever of these theories is true, we really don't know. And if the Bible is silent about something, it's best just to, you know, not speculate. Um, I do not think that they are um, real beings from another planet. I, I, I don't believe that. But there's always that possibility. We don't know. So it's best to just leave that in the realm of things we don't know about and just uh, stick to the Word of God, and you'll be safe sticking to the Word of God. You can't go wrong there because it's absolute truth, and it's infallible and inerrant and perfect. Hmm. You know, Stephen, um, one thing that's interesting is uh, a lot of cults, in fact, most cults reject the divinity of Christ. It's almost as they have... They have something against him being God. They really hate that doctrine. Jehovah's Witnesses, the Way International Cult, there are a number of others. Um, why is it that cults often reject the divinity of Christ? Well, this is interesting, and I, I believe that uh, cults are just manifestations of satanic doctrine. And Satan, frankly, is the enemy of God. He wants to destroy uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you can see in the gospel account of the temptation of Christ how Satan uh, tried to do uh, battle uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and really the Lord Jesus Christ entered into mortal combat with Satan. And the story of the Gospels is the story of Christ's victory over Satan. Uh, but yet, uh, Satan still uh, has some power. Uh, we know that at the end, he's going to be thrown into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, the home of, of Satan and all the angels. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, he does have some limited power. He's not deceiving the nations. They are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. But right at the moment, he is still warring against the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why do cults so often uh, reject the divinity of Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, what is the divinity of Jesus Christ? The divinity of Jesus Christ simply means the Bible's teaching that Jesus Christ is absolute God. He is the second person of the Trinity, himself God, both God and man. And that's a very important doctrine for understanding the atonement, how uh, Christ could suffer and die uh, in the stead of 
all the elect of every age, the entire human race, and instead of all of his people, he could go and his death could be e efficacious on behalf of his people. Very important. Why do the, the cults uh, fight against this? I think really they're trying to humanize Christ in the sense of denying his deity and just making him a mere man. And also they're trying to close the distance between God and man. Uh, and yet that distance cannot be clo closed. God is absolutely holy and righteous and just. He cannot tolerate sin in his presence. He cannot tolerate your sin in his presence. You are highly offensive to the living God. And the Bible teaches that you are a sinner and if you are not regenerate this evening, if you have never been born again, if you have never come to Jesus Christ and been forgiven of your sins and put your faith and trust in him, then the Bible teaches that you are still dead in your trespasses and sins and you are highly offensive to God. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross, it became dark for the space of three hours because uh, God could not look even on his own dear son while he was bearing the sins of his people upon him. But the cults want to close that distance between God and man, make it a little bit more uh, uh, bridgeable, attainable, and yet we cannot close that distance. It is an infinite, infinitely great uh, distance. Uh, Brian, another uh, characteristic of the cults is that almost to, uh, well, they all teach a, a uh, salvation by works and not by grace, and uh, they're legalistic and man-centered. Why is this? Well, one reason is, is that you have to understand that if you do not have a proper understanding of Jesus Christ and His divinity, you know, Jesus Christ is fully God, He's fully man in one person. Uh, theologians refer to this as the hypostatic union of the two natures in Christ, okay? God did not become a man in the sense that God ceased to be God and became a man. He's fully God and truly it has truly has a human nature, okay? That's hard to understand, but the Bible very clearly teaches this. And if you don't understand that, you will not understand the biblical doctrine of salvation. You know, if Jesus Christ had to be God to offer a sacrifice of infinite value to the Father, if he was just a man and not God, or if he was just some great angel, he could not do that. He could not offer a sacrifice of infinite value to the Father. Another thing, Jesus Christ is said to receive the prayers of his people, the prayers of the saints and to intercede in heaven for his people as a high priest. He's a great high priest, it says in, in the book of Hebrews. He has to be God because how, if he's not God, how can he hear the prayers of the millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people that pray to him all over the earth, the Christians? He couldn't do it. He has to be God to truly intercede as a high priest for his people. So if you do not understand the divinity of Christ, you will not have a biblical doctrine of salvation. Another reason. You have to understand that Christianity, biblical Christianity, is truly unique. It's the only, there's no other religion like it in the whole world. Only in biblical Christianity does man not contribute anything to his salvation at all. Jesus Christ does everything. He lives that perfect, sinless life in the place of his people. He dies this bloody sacrificial death to remove the guilt of sin for his people. And anyone, including you, if you're watching this program, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you place your trust in what he has done, and you believe in him as he is presented in the scriptures, he's fully God and fully man. He's not a mighty angel. He's not just a man. He's fully God and fully man. The Bible says you will be saved, not of anything you've done, not of any works that you've done, but solely because of the merits of Jesus Christ. He accomplishes everything for you. Colts hate that. They don't believe in that. They want a religion, a man-centered religion, a works righteousness religion. It's true of the Mormons, true of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's true of Hinduism. It's true of Judaism. It's true of Islam. Only biblical Christianity teaches this wonderful, wonderful doctrine of salvation, and only Christianity has the truth. And, I mean, if God is perfectly holy and righteous, he obviously cannot let sinners into his presence without removing the guilt of that sin. And good works, if you go out and shoot somebody in the head, going out and mowing their lawn and, and trimming their trees and trying to do good works, it's not going to eliminate the guilt from that murder. Hmm. Or if you commit adultery with a guy's wife, it's not going to eliminate the guilt of that sin. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And good